teaching teenagers, for many teachers, including myself, may induce this kind of reaction. But my interview guest today has a lot of experience of this area and some great tips to share. Robert Martinez is a teacher, teacher trainer, academic manager in San Sebastian in Spain. And I spoke to him about the challenges and the joys of teaching young learners and especially teenagers. This is what he had to say. If they know what buttons to push, uh, I don't know if they I can do push. this. A lot of people are either scared of, or they are nervous, as you said, or, or really they don't want to. You need to connect with them. I think teachers and educators, we, we are really lucky because we get to help other people grow. We can see them and help them through their struggles. So how did you get into teaching teenagers? Well, I started teaching in and not just an English in 1994. And after doing a course that was very similar to the CELTA, but was internal, run internally, I was thrown into a classroom with teenagers. And because I have a disability, my left hand, I was, so, um, you know, even with adults, I always felt a little bit apprehensive, especially the first time when you meet a, a person, let alone a group of people. And it was, it was very stressful. I remember my first lesson, I came out and I went to my supervisor and said, uh, I don't know if I can do this. It's, it's, you know, it's, it was, I don't know if I did it well. It was, I was constantly thinking, okay, I need to, I want to connect with them. And my supervisor said, well, that's exactly what we need. You know, that's what you need. You need to connect with them. That is the key to establishing then a report and then having a good lesson. And mm -hmm. so that's how it started, basically. It wasn't very easy at the beginning, but but I think there was something, an urge to connect with, with them. And, and I think that's what's held me throughout my career, really. That's, that's interesting. I guess, I mean, you must have been pretty young at the time yourself, I guess. Yes, I was straight out of Bible college and I was 20, 21 going 22. Right. So you weren't far ahead of them, actually. Well, yeah. Helped? Do you think it helped to be a younger teacher in the connection thing or, or does, did that, is that not relevant, do you think? I don't think age is is very relevant. I think that now when I look back and, you know, my own experience, my experience of observing other teachers as well, I think that age is really not that important. I've seen really, not, not really old, but older teachers mm -hmm. who manage to make that connection and establish that rapport and, and create rapport really quickly and and have really successful lessons with teenagers, which a lot of people are either scared of or they are nervous, as you said, or, or really they don't want to. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, like teaching teenagers, the challenge of teaching teenagers is it, you know, challenges can be positive and they can be negative. And I like to think of teaching teenagers as, Let's see how they're going to challenge me as a teacher today. What is it that I'm going to learn from them? And, and I think that's the joy that has, you know, kept me inspired for so many years. While sometimes people say, oh, no, I really, you know, this is really not for me. I, I need to teach only adults. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, it's, it, you know, not everyone has to like teaching teenagers. Of course, I mean, the, 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 the uh, variety is the spice of life, right? <laughs> yeah. But... But in our in the, in our sector in ELT, more and more adults classes, for example, that's what we've seen. Numbers mm -hmm. are, are going down and down, and then mm -hmm. young learner classes, anyone from four five to eighteen, are the numbers that are really keeping those, at least in the private sector, those schools going. So, when we advertise to get a teacher, is we make it very clear that. It involves, it requires teaching young learners and, and that very little work is going to be with adults. Because a lot of yeah. people say, I don't teach young learners, I don't teach children, mm -hmm. I don't teach uh, teenagers, I want to work with adults. Well, we can't offer an ID. I wonder what, how many schools can actually offer just work with adults in, our, yeah. in, our, in the private sector I'm talking about. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I guess there's a lot, there's a lot of work with teenagers. Clearly, that's where, you know, 
parents are prepared to to put the the uh, their money where their mouths are i suppose Absolutely. aren't they yes yeah. that's right so so do you think that you know you talked about connection i wonder do you do you feel that anybody can learn to teach teenagers or is it a do you have to have a particular mindset a particular personality skill set or That's an excellent question. And, you know, I think that anyone can do it. I'm, you know, I'm the kind of person who they, they say, can you, can you teach, I don't know, how to do this? It's like, okay, give, if you can teach me in a week, I'll give it a try. So I'm, all, I'm always, you know, I'll give it a go. You know, you know, if you don't fail, you don't learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when it comes to teachers, I think that anyone can learn those skills. You know, someone mm -hmm. once told me, oh, we cannot all be like you. And I'm not paid to like the kids, uh, you know, and I don't want to teach them. And I said, well, they're going to feel that. And I said, well, I have problems at home. We all have problems. We all have our lives. But teaching is, for me, is like going to the doctor. I feel better when I go there, when I'm in the classroom, because I can leave everything behind. And I, I wear my new, I'm the rubber educator, teacher uh, mm -hmm. persona, because I think is wonderful and we we are privileged. I think teachers and educators, we we are really lucky because we get to help other people grow. We can see them and help them through their struggles. And so if you can see that and be there for them, then that's when I think they can see that because I think people feel it when you don't want to be in the classroom with them. Um, yeah, I'm that kind of person I have. Yeah, I had a, I remember when I, we were living in Mallorca and I had German classes and I, you know, I could feel it. The teacher didn't want to be there at that time. And, and, and I don't know, I was like, am I the only one feeling it? No, because the, the, mm -hmm. it was very tense. Nobody wanted to be there. People. So for me, what really matters is that's why I said that connection, uh, you know, like the late Rita, um, Rita Pearson had a TED talk here. You've probably seen it on every mm -hmm. kid a champion and she says I, that students don't learn from from teachers they don't like mm -hmm. so it's not a competition i don't need to be liked I, yeah. you know I don't, I, i don't need to be friends with them but if i enjoy teaching and, and if i enjoy my job and i enjoy what i'm doing mm -hmm. i think everything is is a chain reaction yeah I, th i think that's really true and i mean i think that's true actually of teaching any age at any level anything isn't it if if you have a teacher who's passionate about the subject and 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 enjoys it and is enthusiastic about that sort of thing it's a very contagious it is contagious yes i yes, think yes. yeah and i suppose with teenagers they're usually probably not going to the classes completely voluntarily i mean hopefully they like them as you go along but it's probably they're going because their parents have told them or because they've got because they're lagging behind in school or that they you know need to pass an exam mm. or whatever mm. it's usually kind of more external motivation yeah, and it's never gonna i mean i'm not saying oh my classes and are always wonderful and my students are perfect and you know we, mm. they, we can shoot a movie no this year especially was very challenging with a, a group of teenagers um between 13 and 15, 15 years of age. And in a group of 11, four were that case, right? Mm -hmm. Their parents wanted them there. They said it, you know, when we asked, so do you want to be here? What can I do to to motivate you? What is it that you don't like? Let's see, let's see if I can do something to, to help you and me have a good time because clearly mm -hmm. their bad attitude they're not participating, they're not collaborating, they're disrupting uh, the lesson. Obviously, it it, work, it goes both ways, right? I've put mm -hmm. a lot of effort into my lesson, I've put a lot of effort into my materials, trying to get everyone, and then if you have people who don't want to be there. So real life is that. We're always going to encounter teenagers, who, especially teenagers, I would say, but there is a reason for that, and then I'll probably mention that in a minute. Mm -hmm. But if if I I'm already there with the same attitude, things are not going to work. So it's not going to be mm -hmm. easy. But I think the challenge for me personally, I like the fact that students are unpredictable. Human beings, we are unpredictable. So mm -hmm. that element of surprise, how am I going to make them learn? I'm the one usually learning when I'm 
when I find those challenges, I'm constantly, okay, that didn't go very well. So let's see, what can I do? Maybe not as a group, maybe I need them to work in pairs or no, maybe this person had a problem and they need to work individually. Mm-hmm. And something that really opened my eyes as a teacher for teenagers uh, not long ago is the fact that up until the age of 21 or 22, our brains mm-hmm. are still the same. Um, Anna Hasper mentioned it. Um, also, Emma Heiterman, that I did a, a course with her, the Nile course on teaching teenagers. And I've been reading also a little bit about that. And it's true. See, so if if science says that the, the teenage brain up until the age of 21, 22, when they're not teens anymore, the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the still developing, that's why mm-hmm. they can make this, the right decisions. I, that's why they talk back. That's why mm-hmm. they have that. So I think that if we start, uh, what, what, who was it? Carl Covey that said, uh, Stephen Covey that said, seek to understand rather than being understood. Okay, that's nice. I think if we start thinking, okay, well, he's, you know, there's there's, there's different types of behavior. So mm-hmm. let's see if it is if it is not totally unacceptable before mm-hmm. reacting. Let me see if I can talk to the to the student. What was going on? Mm-hmm. How we've we've kind of talked think? quite a lot about, you know, I mean, already um, we'll, there'll be more about this because I guess that's the big issue, isn't it? But but, but what sort of joys are there of teaching teenagers? Because I I haven't had a huge amount of experience of teaching younger learners. Mm. I, I did actually train as a primary school teacher and did that for a couple of years and then ran screaming back to adult ed. Mm. Um, but, uh, but, but one of the things that I noticed when I did teach teenagers relatively briefly was that they really did learn they were sponges for remembering stuff that my adult Mm. learners didn't remember in the same way generally that that Mm. was I really did notice that um and they weren't I don't think they were trying that hard (laughs) I don't think it was because they were going home and they just I guess it's again it's plasticity of a brain that's right that's right yeah. So that for me was one of the, the joys of it. What what sort of joys do you find from from teaching teenagers? Well, I would say that there once you establish that relationship and you get them on board, they'll do anything for you because they st- they're kind of like children. They still want mm-hmm. to please you. And I remember when I was a teenager, it was the same. It was, you know, I was in love with one of my teachers. It was like, I would <laughs> read the book for the weekend just to make sure that, you know, I, I could talk about it. And then my teacher would would say something nice about me. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I think that while they are going through a difficult time, because it's hormones, it's all those chemicals, you know, grumpiness, mm-hmm. not all of them are like that. I think something mm-hmm. that we, that, that, one of the joys I think is that I'm a little bit selfish in that the challenge is what really help, uh, makes me happy because mm-hmm. I don't want a boring lesson. I don't want to go through the course book. I don't want to just go through the motions. I want to learn something about myself by ch- when I know that someone is difficult. Okay, I, how am I going to do this? I know that this person doesn't like working with that other girl. So I need to find a way of they don't like talking very much. I need to make them talk because they're preparing usually for an exam. Most of the time, that's what the parents want. And so mm-hmm. how can I do things? So that kind of like constantly being, for some people, it may be exhausting, but I'm, I'm hyper, so I'm okay with that. <laughs> but um, no, having, surely not. <laughs> so having to think about, uh, be on my feet all the time, thinking about my lesson, how can I make it not just entertaining, but appeal to their uh, interests. I think that's what really works because very often in many of the lessons that I've observed, teachers with good intentions, they're trying to go through the coursework and the material in the program, but Mm -hmm. they very often forget that if there's no interest, one of the big drivers for, for anything, for learning, but for everything, that's why they're just going to sit there doodling or just looking at you as if you were from another planet. So that's why from the beginning, I think investing time in finding out what they did at the weekend, making a note without they, them knowing. And then uh-huh. the folks saying, so how, how was your, how's your cat? Is it okay uh-huh. now? Or, 
you know, like, did, did your parents get you the bike that you wanted that you mentioned last <laughs> lesson? They start thinking, oh, this guy listens. Uh-uh-uh. This guy cares. And I do care. I mean, obviously, you cannot get to know everyone intimately because we uh-huh. especially have different uh, different groups. Uh-huh. But for me, it's worth investing that time in getting to know them because that's once you establish that, everything is a lot smoother. Yeah. yeah. What what uh, you, you, know, you talked about teaching to their interests. How do you actually do that in the classroom? So, for example, um, I learned this probably 20 years ago from, from another trainer. Uh, finding I find someone who at the very beginning of the of the, the school year and throughout maybe every two other three weeks but using that information to gather intel i feel like you know i'm a spy i'm making mm-hmm. notes i'm collecting information about them what mm-hmm. they like what they don't like um asking mm-hmm. from time to time who their favorite singer is very often i mean course i like course books and i think that there's not a problem with the course book the important thing is that we don't teach the course book we teach the students and mm-hmm. we adapt what the course book offers. But mm-hmm. very often, and probably more often than not in my experience, some of the topics for the teenagers, there there's a total disconnect between the reading and who they are. You go like, okay, before the lesson, I'm gonna prepare my lesson about this. This is definitely not gonna work. So I know mm-hmm. my students, so I know that pretty much they're very much into fashion, into someone to study law. So I'm, I'm gonna find an article and then tailor make it, try and make an effort to make it more palatable for them. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise, that's why things don't work. I mean, if you don't mm-hmm. want to read it, there's total disconnect. This doesn't speak to me. I cannot relate t- to this in any possible way. Mm-hmm. They're not going to buy it, right? And that's mm-hmm. when teachers, justly so, they say, oh, but my, you know, they, they don't participate and I prepared the lesson. Mm-hmm. And so I think they're doing things right because they prepared the lessons, they make mm-hmm. an effort, they do care, but mm-hmm. they're missing a big point. Is right. is worth spending time finding out what they like, when types of music. It's a little bit of give and take, I yeah. think, especially with them. And I think that that is interesting, isn't it? People might be kind of going, oh, but I can't prepare a whole lesson from scratch every time and what have you. And that's fair enough because, you know, it's, it's a lot of time and effort. True, yeah. But sometimes a bit of time in that in that preparation stage, as you say, the connection stage and the finding out and will really pay dividends in mm-hmm. reducing your stress over time where that's you've right. got easier lessons that you're not dreading going in on, on Monday morning. Yeah. And agency. So very often is we go in there with our own agenda because we have a program, we have a course, we have syllabus, and this is what we need to do. This is what you're doing. No, Mm -hmm. they're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And so very important to give them agency. Okay, well, guys, we need to do this reading for next, and between now and the end of the next three, four lessons. Mm -hmm. Part of the homework is for you to look at the four readings Mm-hmm. And you're going to choose the ones that you think are okay and the ones that you think is like, Bleh. no, I don't like it. And mm-hmm. next lesson, we're going to negotiate what, what we're going to do it, when we're going to do it. So I'm still covering the program, the syllabus, and I st- I'm still teaching. Mm-hmm. But the fact that you give them vo- a voice, I think mm-hmm. that is when they start, okay, I don't like this, but I'm going to I'm gonna do it today. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not, sometimes we have to do things that we don't like. That is life. Mm-hmm. We can, I'm not saying that our lessons are going to be wonderful if we are happy and cheerful and chirpy. And, no, <laughs> but it's good, definitely going to be better, especially mm-hmm. with teenagers, because there will they will there will be times when we have to do things that nobody wants, mm-hmm. but they are going to be invested in them because they know that you care, that you want them to pass that exam, that you want that every now and then you're constantly asking them i think that's what Mm -hmm. a lot of teachers unfortunately don't really do because not because they don't they're bad teachers no but because they have six classes because they have a program to cover because they are you know they have big classes lots of very many different constraints that you know prevent them from that but i think that if i get my clients i'd like to think of the students as my clients my teenagers (laughs) on board there will be times when I'm tired, when my lesson is not the best lesson. We all have really bad lessons that, you know, mm-hmm. you, go, you finish a lesson and you go like, 
what happened today? <laughs> I thought it was going to be okay. And it was just a disaster. But mm -hmm. th there are times when they are with you and they see that. they. See, I, I'm, I'm 100% convinced that they see through us when you're prepared, when you're happy, when you want to be there, when you care, and when you just that were when you're just there to go through the motions. Mm -mm. No, I'm sure that's I'm sure that's true. So, uh, in moving on a little bit, how do you deal with discipline? So, if if somebody is disruptive in the class or causing other people not to be able to work or generally making a complete pain of themselves, what, yeah. what do you? Probably one of the, the most important tips on classroom management for me, whether they're very young, between, you know, like six and 10 or mm -hmm. teenagers, is we need to learn how to distinguish different types of behavior. Mm -hmm. So what is acceptable and I can ignore and simply just go and say, hey, keep it down, please, or please don't do that. What I can ignore, what is uh, what is uh, accept, uh, acceptable misbehavior, mm -hmm. what is unacceptable, and what is not tolerable or mm -hmm. not totally unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Why am I saying this? Because as a teacher trainer, uh, you know, I get mm -hmm. to observe a lot of people, um, and as an academic manager, I need to observe my teachers as well. And probably something that I've noticed, I think that as in general, I think human beings, we are more and more i don't know what it is it is the war is it is it is it stress what is it but i think we are becoming more less and less tolerant of everything and very irritable uh -huh. and i think that with teenagers if you are very sensitive uh -huh. then you should you you should really take a step back and reconsider because the thing is that there are occasions when i there have been occasions when i've seen some behavior in the classroom that i'm observing I would have ignored it. It's not worth. It's not worth it. Mm -hmm. They're teenagers. They will always do something. You will never have a group of teenagers that are sitting with their arms folded, paying attention, <laughs> answering perfectly at the right time, and co and collaborating every time you ask them to do something. That that class, I think, don't doesn't exist, right? So, can you so, give me an example or two of of sort of behavior which you would say is worth ignoring? Yeah. So, for example, if you know that um, there are two people who are constantly talking in their L1 mm -hmm. and you say the first time, hey, please, you know, like we're doing we're doing this speaking activity in English, not in. Mm -hmm. If they do it and I'm listening when I'm monitoring and I know mm -hmm. that they're 80 percent doing it in English and then they mm -hmm. start talking about something else. Sometimes I tell them you can talk about if you finish, you can talk about whatever you want as long as it's in English. Mm -hmm. So if they're doing it, I'm fine with that. And so, but mm -hmm. they, they need to know. And so mm -hmm. you start going like, okay, well, they're not doing what I want them to do, but they're speaking in English, fine. I can ignore yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Fair enough, right? Mm -hmm. Something that is definitely not acceptable, so is when they are disrupting the lesson, right? Mm -hmm. So they're very important, I think, is, is that that's where empathy and the power of relationships, I think, um, comes in. Nobody likes being put in this on the spot. No, that nobody likes being yelled at. Nobody likes being ridiculed. Nobody likes being shouted at. Nobody, nobody likes being talked to in a sarcastic way. So mm -hmm. instead of saying, "Hey, you," which I've seen done, just go closer. Okay, can I have a word with you for a second? Okay, mm -hmm. what's going on? I know. Have you finished already? Try mm -hmm. and come to their level to show them that you're in control, that you know that they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, and that you mm -hmm. expect collaboration. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it works. This year was, as I said before, it was peculiar because there were four boys in this class that they, in the end, after speaking to the parents repeatedly, constantly, because mm -hmm. obviously... I'm accountable to them as a manager, right? Mm -hmm. it, they were not my students. I covered that class very often. I observed mm -hmm. the class because of the problems and the issues and everything. And we talked with the teacher. We worked together. He's like, what can we do? Okay, mm -hmm. let's try things. Nothing worked. So mm -hmm. after talking to the parents repeatedly, I said, you, you know, you are really wasting your money. I cannot guarantee the results you expect because we've tried this and this and this and this. I've mm -hmm. spoken to them. I've, we've asked them anonymously, do you want to be here? What would you like more of, less of? Mm -hmm. What can I do to, to, to make this work for both of us? Mm -hmm. Nothing worked. 
in the end, they unenrolled, and the parents mm -hmm. said, thank you so much, because, mm -hmm. you know, nobody's ever cared so much to call us 10 times to keep us updated on what's happening, and we don't know what to do with them at home either. <laughs> we hope that they grow out of that phase, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's, it's not surprising. Teenagers, mm -hmm. it's, it's, not mm -hmm. everyone is like that, but it, it's that period. For them, it's a difficult period. Because lots of things are happening. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I guess, you know, people who are listening to this might be sort of thinking, well, that's that's nice in a private language school where you can be unenrolled. And I guess it's perhaps not so easy in a, in a public system with larger numbers of people or whatever. But now that you mentioned public systems, so, for example, one example of unacceptable behaviour was mm -hmm. on, uh, three years ago, four years ago when I was in another building, um, at, we do... Um, extracurricular English lessons at mm -hmm. the public school, at a public mm -hmm. school. And mm -hmm. one 11 year old, you know, um, um, he was coming out of the classroom. I said, You need to be in your classroom, so please go back. Mm -hmm. He swore at me mm -hmm. in Spanish. And so I was like, uh, I switched to Spanish and I said, I speak Spanish. And this mm -hmm. is totally unacceptable. So you go in there and I'll be back in a minute. And I went and got the tutor, the principal, <laughs> like I, we talked together. I said, this is totally unacceptable. This mm -hmm. can not happen again. I talked to the parents. I threw a huge tantrum <laughs> to send a very clear message to everyone else. You can mm -hmm. not, and we're not going to accept disrespect, disrespectful behavior towards any of our teachers. And I think it worked because then very often, you know, they would just not say anything whenever I was around. And for the teachers as well, I said, you, you, do, you know, we need to distinguish between different types of, of, of behavior. But definitely if someone crosses the line and they're disrespectful, it's definitely, definitely zero tolerance. In a nice way, obviously. I, I didn't shout at, him, at the boy. I didn't, you know, but just make sure that you've, as an adult, because we're adults, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very often teachers, when they're under a lot of pressure, it's easy for them to lose it in front of mm -hmm. everyone. And, uh, and that's very unfortunate because we put ourselves at risk. We become the aggressors yeah. because we're the adults. And so I'm yeah. always telling teachers, whatever you want to say, say it mentally. Mm -hmm. Bite your tongue and then come to me and then we'll deal with this together because yeah. it's, it's not worth risking our integrity for someone who's possibly wants to, you know, like oh, if they know what buttons to push, they will push them, especially mm -hmm. teenagers. They will definitely know that if something annoys me and they really don't want to be there regardless of how much I try to charm them and try to calm their way. And this mm -hmm. year was was a very clear example of that. It, it, it just didn't work. It's, you know, like yeah. we, I tried all my tricks, 30 years of teaching, uh, teaching teenagers, training teachers on how to teach teenagers zero to the point that I was thinking it's like oh my god I'm not you know like there's I can't yeah I think it might be quite comforting for quite a lot of people watching who are going well here's a guy who's clearly a very proactive enthusiastic wonderful person and has 30 years of teaching experience with teenagers and is an expert at it and is still saying sometimes it's just hard and sometimes it really doesn't work and you know that's that's yeah. how it is you know you can yeah. do your very best but it is it isn't a, an easy thing to pull off successfully and and I think that that might well comfort some people I don't know there might be some people who are going oh I love my class and everything's hunky-dory but my experience particularly was I was quite young I was in my well, mid-20s when I was teaching in primary school and I had taught adults previously and I just had uh, I think I just didn't set clear enough boundaries. I, you know, I wanted to be their friend, and I, and I think that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because you have to. I think the connection, the sort of things you're talking mm. about, connection are obviously really important, but the there's also a sort of a boundary that you know, no, I am actually the teacher, and there is a power differential here, and I am going to tell you to do things, some of which you might not want to do. And you're going to have to do them anyway, um, and so there's a there's a, a very fine line, sort of a dance there between 
as you say, keeping them on board and 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 taking their needs and wants into consideration mm-hmm. to motivate them, but mm-hmm. also pushing things along when they yeah. don't always always want them. Being being firm and friendly. I was covering a class of uh, seven eight year olds, and uh, I asked them to take out their books and their materials. We were going to check the homework. And this kid goes like, I'm not doing it. I was like, uh, so I came closer and I said, uh, yes, I switched to Spanish so that it was clear because it was a very low level. And I said, uh, yes, you are. You have three seconds to do it or I'm calling your parents, like with a very (laughs) serious face. And he was like, okay. And he took them out. After that, I kept being nice. I went back to nice and friendly and everything. But it was like, no, you're not, you, you know, you're doing what I'm saying. Without yeah. being threatening, without yeah. shouting, without, right? Just being firm and friendly. Yeah. I just wanted to say that that empathy that I mentioned uh, at the beginning goes both ways. And that means we need to be empathetic towards ourselves as well, because we are important. But in that, for me, that empathy means growing a thick skin you know like mm-hmm. i'm not going to be offended by every single thing they say i have a disability mm-hmm. do you want me to tell you how many times i've heard teenagers saying horrible things about my hand or about me or i, I could write a book but that doesn't affect me because my hand or what they say doesn't define me I love mm. teaching regardless of what they're going to do. And I'm going to mm. prove to them that I can that can be better. And when they mm. come around, mm-hmm. that's, when, that's the, the most rewarding feeling in the world. When at the beginning they're horrible and you hear them say things that sometimes you would go like, oh, oh my God, they're nasty. Mm. It's like, oh, I thought I could say horrible <laughs> things. Like, you know, like, this is bad. It depends. Sometimes, only once I heard someone using a bad word and, and then I stopped the whole class. I was like, okay, I'm going to call this out. So I said, close your books. We're going to do a little bit of group therapy. I usually call it group therapy. Right. You just said this. How do you think I feel when you said that? Don't tell me. Think about it. Everyone think for about for 30 seconds. Think about it. How do you think? Think about your feelings. If I call you the same way what well, how would you feel tell your partner and then i go around so he knew that that was bad because he was saying <laughs> feel bad. Was he? like exactly so i didn't make a whole <gasps> you call me that and do it. no it's like okay let's let's talk about this right because mm-hmm. what is funny for you is not funny for others so let's make sure we laugh together but not laugh at others mm-hmm. and he came and apologized at the end of the lesson. He said, I, I, you know, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean that. And I said, okay, don't worry. The important thing is that you are aware of this, you know? Mm-hmm. It's not easy, but what is it? It's funny when we laugh together. It's not funny when only you are laughing. Mm-hmm. So I think that 12-year-old saying, coming and saying, I'm sorry about that, I didn't. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a big, that's big one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a big one because it's one of those times when when they really t- reach out mm-hmm. and touch inside. It's mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. I think I've made a difference today, let yeah. alone English. Just forget about English. I think mm-hmm. I've, I've made a little bit of a contribution to making this person better. Yeah. And so I think that very often we're so preoccupied with, oh, he said this, he offended mm-hmm. me. He, the, mm-hmm. There are times, true, but I think that it's very important to know when to call things out when mm-hmm. to take a more affirmative approach and mm-hmm. more often than not in my opinion life would be a lot easier for everyone and less stressful if people didn't get offended so easily about everything in the class oh, that's, that's an interesting one i think there's so there's a couple of things that come out for me one one is is what you said about you know sometimes really making a difference and i guess that is perhaps one of the the other joys of teaching people who are still developing as people is that you know you you you're educating you probably, them you probably do yeah it's, it's much yeah, more of a wider education role in, in in some ways um and I think if we all think back to teachers in our past who were influential it's when we were at school you know I mean, and other teachers I mean I've had lots of university lecturers and what have you who've, who've definitely made a big impression on me mm. but the people who've left really lasting impressions and who you think 
you know, I wouldn't have really appreciated poetry if it hadn't been for that teacher when I was 14, mm. or I wouldn't have learned to read, actually. <laughs> no. mm. But 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 even with the high school, you know, as a teenager, I think there definitely are teachers who you remember. Um, mm. and, and for bad reasons, too. You know, you said earlier about sort of sarcasm and how that really doesn't have a place in the classroom. And I can remember this. I remember I'm nearly 60 years old. I was perhaps 13 at the time. And French class, I didn't particularly like French school. I really didn't like this teacher very much. And I got something wrong. And he was really acerbic about it and sarcastic. And I just, I could, I shrank into it. I wasn't a very confident child. And uh, remember it now. And I just think that was so unnecessary. And it has had such a long lasting effect that I think that's something really to keep in mind. If remember maybe your own experiences as a child, positive and negative with teachers. Yes, Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, like some of the things that um, nowadays people, you know, like especially now talking about uh, diversity, um, equality and inclusion. And Mm -hmm. it may be because of my disability that I'm a little bit more aware of that. It may be Mm -hmm. that. But you know, like also taking the part, making sure that everyone in the classroom feels safe, you know, Mm -hmm. and that means that if someone calls something, some, you know, a name, name calling, that, you know, that we are aware, if I know my students, even if I know them, I I would call it out. I want Mm -hmm. everyone to feel safe because it's the same thing is because I remember when I was growing up, one of my teachers, there was someone who bullied me and, and because of my hand and was bigger and stronger. And that teacher, specific teacher, never did anything. And they were there. They knew it. So when when mm-hmm. when I actually took justice in my hand, well, in my mm-hmm. hand, only one, <laughs> and then I punched him, they were going to accept me. Oh, but okay. it, you know, it was okay. Where was the teacher? It's like, well, you know, she never does anything. She hears mm-hmm. him calling me names, and I'm no, I've, I've had it. That's mm-hmm. it. And so, I think it's really, really important that we are aware of that. And it's not just about us. Is I think it's about all of us. And and for me, I'm I'm not just an English language teacher. I'm an educator because. Mm-hmm. Very often they need a little lesson to learn, and it's not about mm-hmm. English. We use English to do it, mm-hmm. right, to help them. But it is about life. They cannot go around calling people mm-hmm. names uh, mm-hmm. without ex- having any consequences. I understand because they are developing their brain is developing. They're pushing their boundaries. They mm-hmm. they want to see how far they can get away with things, right? Mm-hmm. We all did. We all went through that. So I think that that understanding is what can de- can make a difference. For me, it has made a difference. So I cannot generalize and say, oh, it's going to make a difference for your lesson. But I think that that awareness has really helped me have mm-hmm. less stressful lessons with mm-hmm. teenagers, not dreading them anymore. On the contrary, mm-hmm. you know, like here at work, I say, oh, I want to I want to have at least one permanent class throughout the school year. I want to be in the classroom mm-hmm. because I enjoy being with, with them in class. The younger ones, I find them refreshing because they say things that you're like, what? I, I hadn't thought about that, right? <laughs> Teenagers are more challenging in a different way. Yeah. Um, but but definitely worth, you know, like trying them out if, if there are any teachers out there who are about to embark on teaching teenagers, mm-hmm. you're going to be fine. The important thing is that be genuine, be empathetic, don't get offended immediately, Take a step back, try and see where they're coming from. Be f- uh, friendly, but firm. And I think that you'll enjoy it, I think. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Robert, for all of that. There's been, I think, a huge amount of information there that'll be useful for a lot of a lot of teachers. So it's been a delight to talk to you, as always. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate well, your time. Check out Robert's YouTube channel here, Learning Together with Robert, for lots of useful videos. Don't forget to subscribe.